Hey everybody, Rosemother here, and welcome to part 49 of my Umineko Let's Play. This is the Tea Party episode, having wrapped up chapter 4 in the last one with an amazing ending. Uh, like I said last week, I will try and see if I can get this all done in one episode, but uh, it is apparently very long, so no guarantees on that, so it might be split into two parts. Uh, people have been saying this Tea Party is probably one of the best ones. So, I uh, guess we'll see what other information that this game is going to give us before we get into the answer arc. So, uh, I think I've been talking long enough. Let's go ahead and let's watch the tea party. The second day, October 5th, 1986. That's right. We never actually finished things up, did we? Badler's still alive. I forgot about this. <laughs> We haven't actually reached the end yet. <laughs> oh my gosh, there was just so much going on at the end after that test with Balor being sent away with Angie. Uh, yeah. Badler seems to be the last one left alive in this game so far. So, Oh, and Maria as well. I don't have a clue what to make of all this. Please, someone explain what happened yesterday in a way I can understand. I continued helping myself to the food in the mansion's kitchen. That massive commercial refrigerator had everything. I could eat and drink as much as I liked. I'd have more than enough to eat, even if the typhoon didn't clear up for a week. With a bottle in one hand, half of which I'd already drunk, I helped myself to some sliced ham. I wonder just how expensive this stuff is. Man, you ingredients are out of luck. If only you'd had Godasan cook you, you could have been reborn as much more incredible food. Is this just Badler, like, in a daze after everything that happened? Being like, everybody's gone. I looked at the clock. Very soon, it would be midnight. October 5th, the second day, would end. The insanity of yesterday's October 4th didn't seem real. That was how little had happened after my so-called test. Is he not going to go try and find Maria? Nothing was happening. No phone calls, no letters, no one coming to see me, no one coming to attack me. Not a goddamn thing. Give me back all the time and energy I wasted being on edge. An entire day, a full 24 hours, and absolutely nothing happened. And I'm sure that nothing will continue to happen as well. A full 24 hours ago, I was called to the front of the mansion by Beatrice. There I was given some kind of weird test to do with determining the successor to the head or something. I gave a serious answer in my own way, but unfortunately we just didn't seem to be getting each other. Beatrice got bent out of shape for no reason and stopped talking to me. I yelled at her to say something, but she wouldn't say a word. Then I asked where Mario was, and she just told me to go to the chapel and went away. What an astounding anticlimax, right? Stupid as it was, it was still a test, so at least tell me whether I passed or failed for hell's sake. What, is she trying to say, good work, your results will be mailed to you later or something? Annoying bitch. In any case, I then headed to the chapel. Both George and Iki and Jessica had been killed after failing their tests. I couldn't let Maria be killed too. Besides, I thought this could be a chance to catch whoever it was while they were in the process of trying to kill Maria. But we know Maria won. She, she's the one. She's the successor, right? When I was young, Jessica often told me I'd get in trouble if I went near the chapel. So I'd never been there, but I at least knew where it was. The chapel was very important in one of the chapters. And then just kind of forgotten about it. I feel like this chapel has something to do with Beatrice. Uh, maybe where the secret... Um, how to get... How to potentially get to the gold, except they said, I think, in one of them that there was no, like, secret entrance entrances or hidden rooms or anything like that in the chapel. I couldn't sense anyone there, but there was a bundle of keys lying in front of the door. I thought this might be a message to open the door to the chapel, but after trying all the keys, I found that none of them fit. I also called Maria's name, but there was no answer whatsoever. I searched around the chapel, but there was a limit to what I could do in the pitch black with just a flashlight. I realized that this key bundle might be a set of master keys, which could possibly open the door to the mansion. Oh, is this where he's going to find the bodies and then we can actually actually see them? Because George is the only one he's actually seen and confirmed dead. Let's just double check the characters, because I'm pretty sure George is the only one that's, yep, only one that's confirmed. 
that's actually been seen by someone. Finding no sign of Maria, I return to the mansion. The mansion was wrapped in silence, and in a horrible stench. Still, it's pretty amazing how good humans are at adapting. Technically, that smell was still pervading the entire mansion, but I'd grown completely used to it and stopped minding it by this point. It didn't feel like anything more than any old house where someone had burnt some meat. The stench knocked me back upon first entering, but I ignored it and decided to head to the dining hall. Oh, that's where all the bodies were, right? Yeah. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. There's, there's that sound, where I found all the corpses that were in such a story, sorry state that Godasan and Kumasawa-san had hesitated to speak of them in any detail. They were the remains of the very first victims, Aunt Natsui and the rest. Alright, now we can check it. It's gonna look very different here, isn't it? Yep, there we go. Natsui, corpse discovered in the dining hall, her head was half destroyed. It seems reasonable to think she was murdered with something like a powerful gun. However, the witnesses don't believe she was killed with a gun. That's another thing we have to figure out. What Goda and Kumasawa and all the others saw versus what actually happened. <laughs> Alright, so same thing. I think it's probably going to say the same for all of them about how it seems like they were murdered with a gun, but the witnesses didn't uh, see a gun. Each of them had half their heads dramatically splattered out, and it was such a gruesome sight that even without knowing a thing about examining corpses, I could pronounce them 100% dead. And on top of that, the remaining half of their faces was left like normal, so it was even easy to identify them. Because Beatrice said that about how doing that on purpose, making it so that it would be traumatic to see, but still make it so that you could, without a doubt, know who it was that was dead. They'd really pulled out all the stops for these corpses. And finally, the bodies here weren't just the six of the first Twilight. They had grown a number, and now included one more. The seventh corpse was Maria. What? Maria? I wasn't expecting that. What? I thought it's because she, sir, she was going to be the successor that she would have survived. Corpse discovered in the dining hall, unable to locate any notable external wounds. Badler speculates it may have been some type of poisoning. The most peaceful method of inviting a person to the Golden Land. Okay. So whoever this Beatrice, Beatrice is. Maria's obviously died before. So they don't have any qualms about killing Maria, but they try to kill her, it seems, in a way that is less traumatic, as giving her some sort of mercy. She was lying next to Aunt Rosa, as though sleeping alongside her. I cried, at the death of an innocent young girl, and at the cruel way my dad and the others had died. I ran about the mansion, swinging my hat, stand spear, yelling, Come out here, you bastard. But there was absolutely no sign of anyone else thinking that they might be hiding somewhere and scheming to attack me from behind. I went around searching for possible hiding places, sometimes being cautious, sometimes intentionally letting my guard down, trying all kinds of things, but in the end, not so much as a kitten appeared. Then morning came. My tension and fatigue mixed together with my drowsiness made for the worst kind of dawn. Humans are pretty incredible. Even though I didn't know where the hell the murderer was hiding, I was prioritizing drowsiness and fatigue over worrying for my own life. By this time, I was starting to feel pretty ridiculous. I'd walked around the mansion for a full six hours until dawn broke, yelling at them to show themselves. Is he going to go into Jessica's room and find her? Is he going to go out into the forest and find everybody else's bodies, or are those just never going to be discovered? I'd done a painstaking search, tired myself out, and even let my guard down. Still, no one was coming to attack me. And so at that point, I just said, screw it. Do whatever you want. The boat wouldn't come until the typhoon passed. They were saying on TV it wouldn't pass until tomorrow, so I had a whole day to waste. The idea of just lazing about didn't even seem ve very appealing. So, even though I knew it would probably make the police mad, I decided to play detective a bit. Let's see if we can get some more information here. First, the dining hall, where the very first murders occurred. The six who were killed in the beginning really were pitiful to look at. The weapon was probably a gun. Maybe their heads were split by something powerful like a magnum bullet or a shotgun. That seemed like valid reasoning. In comparison, Maria, who was the seventh body, had died in a far better and cleaner way. At a glance, there was no external wounds, and it wasn't clear how she had been killed. But there were signs bubbles had been foaming from her mouth, and it looked like a typical death by poisoning that you might see on a TV drama. 
Wasn't Maria called out to the chapel and given her test there? Then why is she here in the corpse-filled dining hall, lying next to her mother, dead? Assuming the cause of death was poison, who gave it to her? Her clothes aren't disturbed at all. It's hard to imagine she was forcibly pushed down and given an injection of poison. So, given that everybody else seems to be dead, or at least we seem to have seen people get killed, it hasn't been confirmed, all the people that were in the dungeon. Uh, yeah, who is left? Who, like, of the humans... Who is left that could be the one? Because Maria, I believe, would only take something like that from someone she believes is Beatrice. So who is this person? It's probably better to assume she was given a poison capsule or something and made to swallow it. That said, compared to the violently mutilated corpses scattered about this room, Maria's corpse was far too clean. With a gun, all you need to do is pull the trigger. But poison, whether injected or made to be swallowed, would take a lot more effort. Bearing in mind the culprit's brutal nature, too, I felt that Maria's death alone had clearly been given special treatment. Why was Maria alone given a sleep-like death? She was killed, so in that sense, I still felt very sorry for her. There could be no doubt about that. But for some reason, the manner of Maria's murder, in particular, seemed very courteous to me. Maria had her hands joined on her chest, in the way that the dead often do. Did Maria do that to herself before dying? Isn't it usually something done by someone else after the person dies? Maria was resting in peace, as though sleeping together with her mother, whose head was half-crushed. For some reason, the contrast really bugged me. There are probably a lot of mysteries surrounding Maria's death, starting with the cause. And more than anything else, the biggest mystery of this dining hall was the pitfalls. The pitfalls that both Uncle Krause's group and Godesans had mentioned. After the six had been killed, five more had fallen through pitfalls and been captured. What are pitfalls? Those things that suddenly open and you fall through them, right? The floor was firmly laid with a majestic, if a bit worn out, carpet. It was clearly a single piece. If pitfalls are meant to open up in it, there would, be an, uh, there would have to be a seam in that one place. And anyway, if there was some trick like a pitfall, wouldn't it creak when you walked on it? No matter how much I walked over or ran my hands over the carpet, I just couldn't imagine that a pitfall was hidden here. In the first place, it would be one thing if a single person had fallen, but it was a full five people. From what I could piece together from all of their stories, each one of them had fallen from a different location. So at the very least, there had to be five separate places concealing pitfalls. So what does this mean? Was this room actually made with pitfalls across the entire floor? So that, with a single button press, you could open up a pitfall in the location of your choice? Some kind of contraption like that? that? That kind of ridiculous mechanism would be surprising even in a ninja mansion. But even so, if Dad and the rest heard about this, maybe they'd say, I wouldn't put it past Grandfather. You bet he'd do this. He'd make this. In any event, I didn't learn anything more than that from the dining hall. Do the pitfalls not exist? Or do they exist, but I just can't find them, amateur that I am? I can't say for sure. Since they claim the pitfalls were there, I can't ignore the pitfalls even if I can can't find them. The next ones to be killed had been Jessica and Georgianiki. I'd already discovered Georgianiki when I call was called out for my test. He was called out to the arbor in the rose garden and shot in the forehead, probably with a gun. But... So he says gun, but there's that whole thing about uh, Gap. He said that apparently she stuck her heel in the forehead. I don't believe that. I think all this was a gun. As for Jessica, she was called to her own room on the second floor of the mansion. I found the door to her room locked, but that wasn't a problem at all since I had the master keys. And the inside of the room was horrible. But the corpse was nothing I hadn't already familiarized myself with in the dining hall, so I'd built up a bit of an immunity. The phone receiver was dangling off the hook. Was she killed while on the phone with me? Look at the blood spatter on the wall. That seems like that would be conducive of, like, a gunshot wound that exits through the back of the head. Jessica's leaning against the wall right next to it with half of her head splattered out. As far as I could tell by looking at the scene... It looked, like the, it looked as though she'd been killed while on the phone. In that case, had the culprit been there before her eyes? Alright, let's check Jessica's now. Jessica, there you are. Corpse discovered in her own room on the second floor of the mansion. Her head was half destroyed. It seems reasonable to think she was murdered with something like a powerful gun. 
destroyed herself with her own strike with George's counteracting type barrier. If you believe that. I'm leaning more towards gun. I hadn't got that impression from Jessica's voice over the phone. I'm pretty sure Jessica said, they got me. It's probably best to assume she'd already received a fatal wound at the time of the phone call. That's right. And she also said this. Yes, she definitely said that. From what I could tell by looking at Jessica's corpse, there was no wounds on her other than the damage to her head. Then, she was injured seriously enough that she steeled herself for death and then died halfway through the phone call? But it feels like with the way she was talking on the phone, she was out of danger for the time being. You shouldn't be able to have a casual conversation over the phone if the killer is right in front of you. So did the culprit come partway through the phone call and kill her? No, that can't be right. After all, this room is locked. Another locked room scenario, of course. No, like hell, that counts for anything. He's like, I've seen so many of these and nothing ma it, That doesn't matter anymore. And the culprit had stolen a master key from one of the victims. The fact that it was locked is meaningless. But there are no external wounds other than her head. In which case, should I assume the fatal wound she was prepared to die from and the actual wound that destroyed her head were two different events? Both of them made to the same part of the body. In other words, Jessica was struck severely to the head and received an incredibly bad wound. Then she called me and either lost consciousness or died while on the phone. Then the culprit came and destroyed her head for real or something. I appreciate the fact that they're going through this like a synopsis of what's actually happened and, and, to, and seeing it from like a human's perspective. From a like a realistic perspective of like this is what I see and this is what I think happened. After being called to this room, Jessica was attacked by the culprit and seriously injured. And the culprit thought they'd killed her and went away for the time being. But then Jessica miraculously started breathing again and called me with a literal dying message. Then the culprit realized they had failed in killing her and rushed back to deliver the final blow to Jessica, who had lost consciousness from massive blood loss. That seems to make sense, more or less, except for how Jessica was able to accurately predict the form of that final blow. And there was one more thing that bugged me about the phone call from Jessica. Jessica said this. Yeah, how did she know that? How did she know that if she didn't see his body because she was completely separate from him she said it almost as though she'd witnessed george aniki being killed but while you certainly could see the rose garden from the window in jessica's room the arbor that george aniki had been called to was very far away you could only just make out the roof add to the fact it was the night of a typhoon it's very hard to imagine she was able to witness everything that happened by the arbor from this window and most important of all, Jessica left before Georgianiki, so she shouldn't have known that Georgianiki's test had taken place by the arbor. How did Jessica know that Georgianiki had been killed? Very good questions, all very good questions that I have no answers for. Then, in the course of my search of the entire mansion, I found Kyrie-san's corpse as well. She was in an old guest room tucked away on the first floor. This was where all us relatives used to stay before the guest house was built. The situation with Kyrie-san was just like Jessica's. She was probably killed during her phone call with me. Alright, let's check her out too. Corpse discovered in a guest room inside the mansion. There was a single hole right in the center of her forehead. It seems reasonable to think she was shot with a gun or something. A demon stake was rammed into her forehead, but it is difficult to imagine this was the cause of death. I didn't miss. I missed on purpose to torment her. Yeah. So, I think she's the only one, so far at least, that has the stake in there. The receiver was hanging untidily, and Kyrie-san was collapsed beside it. But the way she'd been killed, it was very different from Jessica. Her head wasn't smashed. Instead, something like a stake with an occult-like design was buried into her forehead. It was too gruesome for me, so I pulled it out. It was only after pulling it out that I realized that this might get me in trouble with the police later. Oh, Badler's so naive to think he's going to make it to talk to the police. 
So even though it was probably a little late now, I laid it by Karyasan's side. Its tip was sharp and stained with enough blood that it must have penetrated fully to the brain. I didn't know what kind of metal it was made of, but it was about as heavy as a paperweight. Certainly if you were stabbed all out with something like this, it might cause a terrible wound. I probably understood what the stake meant. Yeah, I know this. It's the method of killing from the fourth twilight onwards in the witch's epitaph. That gouge with a stake and kill thing, probably. Which means that everybody else from the dungeon should also have those, right? If he's going to even find those bodies, because they're out in the forest. However, the human skull is very hard. Even with all one's strength, could you really pierce through it this sharply? No. The way I reason it, the stake wasn't the cause of death. It was just used to damage the corpse after death. She was probably killed by being shot with a gun or something, like Georgianiki. And the stake was stuck into the hole left by the gun. Thinking about it that way, everything works out. But, was Kiryasan really killed with a gun? She had said this on the phone as well. Kiryasan was under attack, even though she was holed up inside a locker room. Wait. Sorry, let me just check again. Did they say that George also had the stake? In him? Okay, so it just says there's a single hole in the center of his forehead. Nothing about a stake, though. And this room actually was locked. And... She had said something about a golden thread-like thing flying in through the keyhole and attacking her. This is something I really want to figure out. This is something that's been said by people multiple times throughout different chapters about this golden thread that can get in through locked rooms, through a keyhole. And in fact, there were four places around Kiryasan's corpse with holes that could have been caused by some kind of attack. But still, a golden thread attacked her through the keyhole? It's not a golden thread. The only thing I could think of is, like, if someone was using a sniper rifle and they were able to aim it through the keyhole and there was, like, the red dot, but that seems far-fetched. <laughs> I looked at the door from Kiryasan's perspective. If I'd been, or if it had been one of those old locks, you, like you see in old mystery movies, where you can peek through to the other side, then you can understand that something might potentially have come through it. Oh, but even though the doors in this mansion were old-fashioned, the locks were the familiar, average cylinder style you could find in any normal home. In other words, there was no hole going all the way through, but... Okay, never mind. That rules that out by construction. So no matter how thin an object might have been, it's impossible to imagine it could have penetrated through the keyhole from the outside and attacked her. Cylinder lock. Keyhole? But Kiryasan had definitely said something like a golden thread had flown in through the keyhole and spun around and around, aiming for her, attacking her. A golden thread attacking through the keyhole. I couldn't understand what it meant at all. Wait, actually, Kiryasan predicted I probably wouldn't be able to understand all this. And not just Kiryasan. Jessica said it over the phone, too. No, since the very beginning, from the time we talked with Godasan and Kumasawa-san, and got the phone call from Uncle Krause's group, everyone has been saying the same consistent thing. Grandfather is summoning witches and demons and killing people with magic. We witnessed it happening with our very own eyes. No tricks, no illusions, no choice but to believe it. They all said it with one voice. Maybe they were told by somebody to say this. Maybe they were bribed, maybe they were threatened. I don't, I don't know why everybody would have the same story, but it still seems so fantastical and impossible to me. But that mysterious woman calling herself Beatrice appeared, or when that mysterious woman calling herself Beatrice appeared, even I pretty much believed she was a real witch and might start summoning goat monsters right and left. However, after being left alone for a whole day, once my feelings of tension faded completely, I had a level enough head to think this was way too stupid to possibly be true. In that extraordinary situation where their lives were exposed to danger, did they just lose their heads and mistakenly think a witch was attacking them with magic? I could go back to my thing about maybe they were being pumped full of drugs, but for them to all imagine the same thing? It seems pretty impossible. But multiple people testified to the same effect, and on top of that, none of their opinions contradicted one another. If it had been a single person statement, I'd be able to suspect that they just didn't see what they thought they saw. But doing that now is pretty difficult. Then, right next to the back door, I found Uncle Krause with his head half-destroyed. 
even though he'd escaped the dungeon at Kordorian, and somehow made it out of the secret underground passage, and all the way here, he was killed. Alright, Uncle Kroos. Corpse discovered in the vicinity of the mansion's back entrance. His head was half destroyed. It seems reasonable to think he was murdered with a powerful gun. A demon stake was rammed into the destroyed portion of his head. None can escape the Chester sisters' golden arrows. Buried into the gruesome cross-section of his half-destroyed head was a stake with an occult design, just like the one that was driven into Kyriasan's forehead. And in this situation, it was very hard to imagine that the stake was the murder weapon. He was killed with a powerful gun like the six in the dining hall. And after death, he was stuck with a stake, like Kyriasan. I wonder if the golden threads that Kyriasan spoke of attacked Uncle Kroos, too. Does there exist some kind of tool, like an endoscope? which is very thin, but can be moved about at will, and that can also attack people? No way. I've never even heard of anything like that. But even so, if I voiced that suspicion to one of my relatives, perhaps they would say I wouldn't put it past grandfather to make one. That seems to just always be the thing. It's just like, he's got a lot of money. He, he could do it. He's crazy. He could. S since I can't refute the existence of a golden thread X that can be moved at will and attack people, my only options are either to accept this completely incomprehensible weapon, or else, to accept that these murders were committed with magic. To find the next corpse, I had to go out through the back door and search around outside a bit. Behind the mansion, in the wild-grown bushes that were almost swallowed up by the forest, there was something like an old well- Oh! Well, it seems to be closed up, but I was like, maybe he actually will be able to get into the dungeon and see... Maybe he'll even find the, uh, the room with the gold. And right next to it were the corpses of Dr. Nanjo and Shannon Chan. Both corpses had their heads smashed, and there was a stake lying right next to each of their destroyed heads, though they weren't stuck in. All the corpses were atrocious, but having to look directly at Shannon Chan's lovely face, half of which was blown off, was very painful. All right, let's see, Shannon. Corpse discovered behind the mansion, her head was half destroyed. It seems reasonable to think she was shot with a gun. A demon stake was lying next to the corpse. The witnesses understand one thing at least, it was not the stake that killed her. And then Nanjo, corpse discovered behind the mansion, his head was half destroyed. Uh, also seems reasonable to think he was shot with a gun. A demon stake was lying next to the corpse. I'm just, like, looking at, at over all of them. Just to see if there's any, anything I can glean from it, but not really. Then, there was the well. Nothing about Nanjo, eh? But, like, oh, Shannon, she was so pretty. It's so sad to see her like this. Nanjo, nothing. Inside, which I was told was a secret underground passage to the mysterious mansion, Kuadorian. By this time, I was beginning to think that Beatrice and her accomplices might have used this underground passage to leave for Corridor, and so if he goes down there, he's gonna find, uh, Cannon. They were supposedly ten or more of these guys, and I hadn't seen hide nor hair of any of them. It made a hell of a lot of sense to think they'd already escaped somewhere else. They had this typhoon to contend with. They couldn't go out to sea. Same for the forest. There was no way they could traverse such a deep, uncultivated forest on foot. In that case, there was only one place for them to go. The mysterious hidden mansion, Kuadorian. Oh, here we go. He's going to find it out. Maybe we'll actually get to see more of the mansion than just the dungeon area. A secret underground passage at the bottom of the well. By this time, I'd entirely lost my fear of being killed if I happened to come across the enemy. Screwing with me like this. This time, I'll march into your mansion. Uh, <laughs> The old well had a firm cover on it. The cover was an iron grill. The gaps between the bars were perhaps 20 centimeters square. You could peer inside, but it really wasn't something a human could pass through. If I hadn't known better, I wouldn't have thought it to be anything more than a simple cover to protect against falling in. But from what Kirisan had told me, I knew it had been made to prevent intruders from entering the secret underground passage at the bottom. So, someone came by after and put this grid on it, or... Was this grid on here the whole time, and in that case, how did these bodies appear? 
But the cover was fixed in place extremely firmly, and no matter how much I pushed or pulled, I couldn't even get close to removing it. So yet another mystery is like, how did these bodies get out of the tunnel? And if uh, it was open before, who came and locked it back up and how? I couldn't find any obvious lock. Maybe it was sealed by some mechanis mechanism. But no matter how much I investigated it, I couldn't find anything to release it. The underground passage in the swell is the biggest piece of information I have. That Carrie Sun gambled her last moments trying to tell me about. I had an idea of where to get one, because I'd seen the various tools in the gardening shed where we locked Godasan and Kumasawa in there. Oh, so maybe he's gonna he's gonna get to see their bodies close up and confirm their deaths and get some more information about that. But the shutter to the gardening shed was locked. On top of that, the key was with Godasan, who is inside, dead. In other words, this gardening storehouse was a locked room. There was no way to open it from the outside. In that case, I'd have to break the shutter. I wonder if there's a tool for that somewhere. It kind of felt like I was going in circles. Then, while searching for that, I learned that the source of the stench that had been permeating the mansion this whole time was the underground boiler room, and Kinza will be in there because we saw, at least in the Beatrice thing, that his body was burned. His body always is burned. The boiler room was dimly lit, humid, had a terrible stench, and on top of all that, was incredibly creepy. But there were several large tools there, and I was able to find a fire hatchet and a massive bolt cutter. And grandfather's corpse, too. Yep. Alright. So we're almost at everybody. Still haven't found Cannon because he's his body is uh, in that uh, tunnel that's locked up. Uh, Kinzo discovered as a burnt corpse from the incinerator in the underground boiler room. As there were no signs he fought to get out of the incinerator, it seems reasonable to think he was burned after he was murdered. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes, the dead to the dead. No, strictly speaking, I should probably say that I found the burnt corpse of a person who was probably grandfather. Someone's corpse had been stuffed into the blazing fires of the boulder. A uh, boiler. However, by coincidence, I was able to notice the number of toes on the corpse. Both feet had six toes. Yeah, actually, I might have heard from Dad at some point, long ago. Something about grandfather having polydactyl with extra toes. It was apparently an old Ushuramiya tradition for people with extra fingers or toes to be treated as a good omen, saying that they had good fortune or something. And that's why Grandfather was selected to be the next head, or something along those lines. But I wonder if I can be certain that this is Grandfather's body just from the number of toes. After all, Grandfather was supposed to be the leader of the group of culprits, so... In some instances, it seems that the killer wants it to be very obvious who the body is, uh, by having the face be half like blown apart but still enough that you can tell who it is but always in Kinzo's case he's burnt and they yes they want you to notice the number of toes but like I said at the very beginning could be another body of an, maybe another Ushuramiya or another body that has six toes to throw off you know the scent or you know like throw the person off thinking that it's like oh it's got to be Kinzo but it, it might not be I don't have a clue why he'd be dead and stuffed in a boiler in a place like this. Like, so the person always intentionally puts Kinzo in the boiler, knowing that the smell is going to attract people. They're going to come down and see the, uh, the corpse and assume it's Kinzo, but it might not be. A mysterious corpse burning and belching out a terrible stench amid the flames. If it really was Grandfather, did that mean the leader of the group of culprits wasn't Grandfather, but that Beatrice after all? Grandfather was used because he was convenient, and was then thrown away at the end. Unfortunately, it didn't look like I'd be given a chance to hear Grandfather's explanation. Now that I obtained a tool, I thought about immediately taking on the cover to the well. But I decided to break the shutter to the gardening shed first. Okay, so we are going to get to go in there, right? Right, right. So we'll find Cannon and hopefully f get some more information on this Kumadorian place. I had plenty of time to kill anyway. I thought I should check on the condition of Godasan and Kumasawasan's corpses. I hit the shutter with the hatchet, breaking it into it. 
struck the bolt cutter in, or stuck the bolt cutter into the crack and scissored it around, opening up a hole. Then I came face to face with Godasan and Kumasawasan's corpses once more. Let's do all right. Kumasawa corpse discovered in the Rose Garden storehouse. It's hy oh, but we see a bullet hole. What looks like a bullet hole. It's hypothesized she was shot in the forehead and then strung up by her neck. As long as a locked room could be constructed, anything would have sufficed. And go to oh, but interesting. Okay, so the head is. I guess I usually see, but in this case, you see how in like with Shannon. And with Rosa, you still have some of the face is visible, right? But with this one, it's completely blanked out. Huh. But we can clearly see it's them. Corpse discovered in the Rose Garden. Storehouse hypothesized that he was shot in the forehead, strung up by the neck. They themselves put their necks in the nooses. It was an interesting experience to try on occasion. Okay, that's... Hmm. As a result, I learned some new facts. First, they did not die by being hanged. Their feet were solidly on the floor, and both their foreheads showed signs that they had been shot with a gun. When I thought about what a normal noose was like, the rope seemed considerably on the long side. On top of that, the length was different on each to match the height of each person. In other words, the lengths had been adjusted so both Godasan, who was tall, and Kumasawasan, who was short, had their feet solidly but barely on the ground. So why would the person string them up like this? Like, obscuring it and making it look like they hung themselves, but then not going the extra mile and stringing their bodies up completely. Also, while the ropes carried both their weights as their heads lolled, both of them had some slack below their knees. This meant if they stood upright with these nooses around their neck, there would be some extra length. In other words, these ropes were a bit unsuitable to hang someone with. This is really weird. The direct cause of death was probably the shot to the head. It was gruesome. Their insides were still dripping out from those deep holes, staining their faces a deep red. Then they were hung up by their necks and left on display. That probably makes the most sense. If they were shot with a gun, they'd probably have been lying down on the floor. If that had been the case, you wouldn't have been able to tell they were dead by peeking through the window. Oh, so they just wanted to make sure that the person could absolutely be able to see that they were dead? A mountain of stuff would have gotten in the way. So, if they'd been lying down, they would have been hidden. That's always the thing, too, is, like, making it very obvious the body's, like, it's a spectacle. To make the deaths of those two known to the rest of us who couldn't get inside. They had to hang them like this so we could tell from the outside. Was this to get back at us for thinking the two of them would surely be safe if we left the key with them? I wonder where the shutter key we gave Godasan, which should have ensured their safety, is now. That key was in his trouser pocket. The gardening shed key had been kindly left there, and even the tag was still attached. In other words, the gardening storehouse was a locked room after all. And that gave rise to another question. Because this hanging was inexplicable. If they didn't commit suicide, then the nooses were set up by the culprit. It might have been possible to shoot them through the window, which I first thought would have happened. But I really can't imagine someone could have tied two ropes to the beam from the outside. And on top of that, they'd have to lift up the heavy corpses. There's just no way. In other words, to do all this, they would have to go inside. But the key was in Godasan's pocket, and the shutter was still locked. In other words, the gardening storehouse was a locked room. Godasan had said that there was only one key for the shutter. But is it possible that there was a copy, and that the culprit was in possession of it? If we're allowed to theorize that there were actually multiple gardening uh, storehouse keys, and that Godasan just didn't know about them, then this isn't even close to a, clocked, to a locked room. But why is it that, despite the fact almost all the other corpses were shot to, dead, to death and left almost completely alone, these two corpses alone were intentionally hoisted up? I couldn't help but feel something a bit odd about that. Yeah, no kidding. Assuming the mystery corpse in the boiler was Grandfather, the deaths of 16 people had now been confirmed. There were 18 people on this island. There's me and 16 corpses. Ken and Kun's corpse was the only one I hadn't been able to confirm yet. But we're about to, I'm guessing. We're heading back to that tunnel. According to Kiryasan, he was killed while climbing out of the well and fell down into it. So with the well closed up like this, it was impossible to check. 
I tried shining a flashlight through the bars, down into the darkness and the depths of the well. But it seemed that the jet-black darkness had no intention of showing me its innermost depths with this inadequate light. It looked like, I, like I'd have to break the bars after all. Using the hatchets and things I dragged out of the boiler room and the gardening shed, I tried breaking the cover of the well. But the metal bars were extraordinarily sturdy, and breaking them wasn't easy. I hit them with the hatchet over and over until my hands started feeling weird, and eventually gave up on breaking them. It was impossible. If they were at least wood, I might have been able to break them. But this metal... Yeah, there's no way you can slice through metal bars like butter with the human strength. I can't even begin to understand that story about how Cannon couldn't cut through the metal bars, right? She told me a light like a red laser beam grew out of his arm, and he used it to slice through the metal bars like a knife through butter. Cutting through metal bars like butter? And what's with that red laser beam? Does that mean he snuck in a burner or something, and used that to burn through the bars? Still, just what kind of laser could cut through metal bars like butter? It sounds exactly like the kinds of laser beams that showed up in those robot anime I loved as a kid. Does stuff like that actually exist? And how did Cannon couldn't get that laser beam? As much as I wanted to ask him, he's already been killed. Plus, even his corpse is now at the bottom of the well, beyond this cover. If Cannon could manage to slice through those metal bars, I'm sure he could handle this metal cover in a single swing. It kind of feels like the locked room just now. Now we have a locked grate, a locked tunnel situation, with Godasan locked inside the gardening storehouse, holding the key. Only one person can open the door, but they're locked inside. If only I had the power of Kanonkuns, I could do something about this cover myself. Just who is Kanonkun? He couldn't really be an inhuman being capable of using a strange power, right? Even Kiryasan told me to believe in witches, and I've also met an insane woman calling herself one. Could Kanonkun possibly be a human on the witch side? Or else, the culprit? What the heck? Am I gonna start treating him like the culprit just because I can't find his corpse? お。死体がないだけで一番最初に死亡した。つまりは、<笑> At a glance, this appears to be a mass murder committed using something strange that could only be thought of as magic. Golden threads that attacked through keyholes. No, we even had testimony that something gold had flown around the dining hall during the first six murders. The two might have been the same weapon. Then there was the locked room murder of the garden shed and the laser beam that could cut through metal bars. And that wasn't all. There was much, much more, like the group of goat monsters, the talk of a witch who could create pitfalls just by snapping her fingers, the rabbit-like demons who had fired golden threats. And I have to cover this stuff during my discussion and theory video. Oh, I'm stressing so much about it. I think there were more, and each and every one of them was ridiculous. I couldn't possibly accept it, and was forced to suspect that there was some kind of trick or mistake. But why in the world had everyone spoken with one voice, saying the same thing without contradictions in their testimony? It's not only the magic. Mari's mysterious death. Jessica somehow knowing that George and Iki had been killed. The mysterious burnt corpse, which I couldn't confirm, actually belonged to my piece of shit grandfather. And more, and more. All stuff I just don't get. I tilted the bottle and glugged it down noisily. I didn't have a clue what was going on. 
After dinner last night, we kids were shooed out of the mansion and told to go back to the guest house. And then there was a massacre in the dining hall. Curious son and the rest were dropped through pitfalls and captured. Then Jessica and George and Iki were called out to a test or whatever and killed. Curious son's group managed to escape the dungeon somehow, but all of them were killed in the end. And at the very, very end, even Mario was killed, leaving me all alone. In short, I had done nothing except be locked up in the guest house. During that time, a huge incident had occurred and ended before I knew it. What could I call it except incomprehensible? I don't have a clue anymore. もう I haven't had any sleep since yesterday, and I'm tired as all get out. You want to kill me? Be my guest. I decided to return to the guest house and boldly rest on the bed. As I exited the kitchen and passed through the lobby, that portrait of the witch came into view. The big clock did too. At that very moment, it was exactly midnight. And the sound of the bell, proclaiming that it was midnight, rang out. As I listened, I looked up at Beatrice's portrait. Exactly 24 hours ago, I met you. What were you trying to say to me? And where did you go? Just who in the world are you? Golden Witch, Beatrice. I haven't solved a single one of the riddles surrounding you. Show yourself, and fight with me. All right, I think this is the point where stuff is going to start getting wild. Someone said, once that once that uh, clock strikes midnight, shit's about to go down. Then the witch showed herself. Like a guest of honor finally appearing, she showed herself on the landing at the top of the big staircase. ようやく姿を現し上がったな。丸一日。退屈させられてたところだぜ。Alright, right. are they going to go at each other again with the blue versus the red here and try see if we can get some more stuff figured out? そなたに絶対の勝利の執念を与えた。エンジェの名を口にするな。あの無残な死は。そなたにとって必要なものだ。あの死を見なければ。そなたは本気にならない。エンジェの幸を好き未来を自覚しなければ。そなたに勝利の
魔女も魔法も幻想も妄想も全て俺がぶっ飛ばすさあ追っ始めようぜもう二度とごまかさせないゲーム再開だぜお前という嘘っぱちを追う魔女のベールを俺が引き裂いてやる長いわ素直に一言わらわを殺してやると言えばよいああその言葉をお望みなら言ってやるさ俺が聞いてやるお前の望みで最初で最後のものだ感謝するお前をお前を I will kill you and in fact she thanks him for it. it's like she wants to be done with this now but the only way like she said the only way that this can end is if he kills her because she's locked in forever and now she's saying it's like it's a it's a guaranteed victory on his part eventually he's gonna win <laughs> Battlers cry burneth the a world with a white light, and when one's eyes were opened to that brilliant light, the two of them could be seen in a rose garden. Are we back in the Golden Land? Oh, I think this is a new song. Alright, let's do it. The Rose Garden, where beautiful rose petals danced. The color of those rose petals was red. Was that proof or simply a claim that the two of them faced each other in this beautiful rose garden was the red and only truth? That must be why the roses are red. But in the language of flowers, roses are passion, not truth. The flower for truth is forget-me-not. That flower is blue. Oh boy, here we go. All right, we're going all the way back. Okay, let's do it. I can see why this is going to be a long tea party is because we're we're going through all of the uh, all the arcs right now it seems like okay. Alright, so we're going back to this. I... It's crazy to think that that was so long ago. That was like at the beginning of this chapter, which seems like such a long time ago, probably because it was such a long time ago, when I was so sure they brought up that whole idea of Kinzo already being dead when Kyrie brought that up, and I was like, yes, yes, yes. I was, because that's what I was thinking too. And then Kinzo came out, and I was like, no, it got shot down. But all right, let's hear what Battler has to say about why he thinks that this is the case. <laughs> You can break through all of the murders in episode 1 by supposing an unknown person X. Furthermore, it's even possible to explain the mystery of Kinzo's evaporation from the locked room sealed by the receipt by making the bold assumption that Kinzo wasn't there from the beginning. The problem is that things change in each game. There are some things that do stay the same, but like for example in this one, um, people saw Kinzo, so how is it possible that he's actually dead? Unless Beto countered this with a red truth, the witch illusions of episode 1 would be completely smashed. The blue truth was valid. Alright. 
The wedge of blue truth Balor had really stabbed right through the top of Beto's left foot. Oh boy, this is like uh, this is like that Virgilia fight, her versus Beto. And it's actually a, a physical thing, okay. Was the red blood that poured out from there her defense in the red truth? Beto shut one of her eyes tight, enduring the unbearable pain from the wedge of blue truth that denied her. So she's not denying it, so... So at least from chapter one, Kinzo was dead the whole time. But once again, this chapter, that doesn't seem to be the case. I'm just confused how um, different things can be true in one in one game, but not true in another. Like, how is Kinzo dead already in one? I guess the order of the... But if Kinzo was alive from the beginning, then that takes away his... Um, his thing about the whole, like, oh, well, if Kinzo was dead from the beginning, then there's another person that's not accounted for. But if Kinzo was alive in this game, then that means that the 18 people should be accounted for, right? I, I'm so confused. I do like that they're going back and they're- because I definitely need the refresher. <laughs> Are we gonna go through every locked room situation? Because, like, that's only one. There were so many locked rooms in all the games. <laughs> we could spend another two hours just going through the locked room situation. The blue wedge piercing uh, Beato shook. She was resisting, fighting to push it out. いや。俺の青木真実は揺るがない。犯人X so now we're talking about accomplices. That's another that's another thing. I've also said that about certain things. It's it doesn't necessarily just have to be one person. Like I said with the whole thing with um Ava, is I suspect that Hideyoshi may have had some he may have helped her in some cases. It, directly or indirectly with the murders, I don't know. But yeah, exactly. Who's to say that there's only one person working on their own this whole time? Like I said, like, Ava I know for sure killed some people, but this other mystery person killed people that Ava didn't know about, like George and Hideyoshi, for example. Okay. I did think about Rosa being an accomplice. Uh, my thing was Ava, but... But we could go back to all the, uh... All the chapters and maybe say there was an accomplice in every single one. Interesting. Are we about to beat Beatrice right here? So is the answer arc literally just going to be like showing the actual thing, like what happened in each, in each chapter? Oh, this will be interesting. We might get all of our answers right here, right now. In that case, I wouldn't really be able to give up much of a theory video, would I? <laughs> the wedge that had been gradually losing its brilliance and seemed as though it was about to come out regained its strong blue again, thanks to Badler's additional red truth or blue truth, and dug into Beato again, eating into her foot. Beto let out a moan of anguish at the pain of it. まだ答えぬ。まだ答えぬ。まだだ。さらに続けたい。第3のゲームだ。6連結の連鎖密室。Oh yes, this too. All right, the linked rooms. 
That was the that was the Ava one, the third game. Yes. Yes. All right, here we go. I really like this music. It feels so hopeful. <laughs> okay, she's not denying it. Oh, or she is. I think I think my theory for this when I did my theory video was that George snuck out. There was one, there was one window that could be opened from the inside, and it was closed. Um, so I think I said I that Nanjo may have helped him get out, or that George escaped on his own, and then maybe Nanjo saw that the window was open and then just closed it afterwards, and that would explain why the window was closed, but George was gone. But, notice how she didn't put that in right about how he flew out the window. She can't say that in red, only that he didn't go downstairs. In the final stages of the third game, George suddenly vanished from the second floor of the guest house. Ava, who had been on the first floor, claimed that no one had come downstairs. But if, as the Blue Truth claimed, she had carried Kraus and Natsui's corpses outside, there was the possibility that George could have secretly gone downstairs during that gap in time and escaped. Oh, okay, I didn't think about that. But by adding on to the Red Truth, Beato had disproven that. To go outside without going down the stairs to the first floor, he would have had to leave by the window. But all the windows were locked from the inside. Is Valerie going to say what I said? まどから飛び去ったんだろ死体飛び降りても芝生じゃわからないしあの大雨だ多少の痕跡なんて消えちまう赤き真実を繰り返す外部へ通ずる窓も扉も全て内側より施錠されていたぞしかもそれらの施
そして地下牢から脱出したメンバーの殺害も食堂と同じで銃によるもの不審な点はないだが分かってるぜ反撃があるんだろう来いよそなたの最大の刃である18 Yes, here we go. This is what I need to This is what I need to figure out そう来ることはわらわも分かってだから金蔵を書斎より出した Oh wow, so she's straight up saying that Kinzo was alive in all the games. Unless it was someone disguised as Kinzo, I don't know. So, that's it. So, that's it. So, that's it. So, that's it. Oh, is that what Bella's gonna say? Was someone disguised as Kinzo? Hmm. みんな気にしないかもな。俺は後悔す。その爺様は別人の替え玉だ。親族たちが爺様と見間違えた別人だ。ならば我らは後悔す。Okay, they keep saying by sight. She keeps saying by sight. Naraba Kokais. Omaiwa, Daichi no game jidewa. Go hon ijo sonzai surkotoni nap teita master key no hon suu. Kaini no game jini. Akaki shinjis de go hon to sengen surkotoni. Okay, okay. Alright, let me read this again. By declaring with the red truth in the second game that the number of master keys was five, when the first game the number was more than five, you changed the premises of the later game. Okay. Huh. I'm still a little confused how that could be. I I don't understand how, like the idea of a game, like how someone can be. Uh, I mean, I guess the characters do die at different times as well, but like, with the exception of Ava, I guess Ava did manage to survive one of the games, whereas in all the other games, everybody died. That's the thing I'm still stuck on. Ugh. <laughs> 食堂での6人殺しはじい様が自ら執行したと仮定しても何の矛盾も生じないならば公開そう4つのゲーム開始時の金属の設定 OK That's what I needed I need I need that I need that to like latch on to 第4のゲームのみ because the thing is that yes, Ava did survive one of the games, but that's the game that is the world line where things continued on afterwards. You know, like where the Angie from 1998 grew up with Ava because she escaped. So we can see that world line continuing. But like, yeah, the Kinzo thing, I was just like, it's weird that he would just be dead in all the other games and then be alive in one. Kinzo was alive at the start of the game. Okay, she's not repeating that. Ah! The red truths are frustrating because like, it could just be that she is lying and that's not true, or it could be that she's intentionally withholding it. Okay, now we got Kinzo here. My goddamn granddad wavered into vision. Is he trying to be some kind of knight and <laughs> blocking the way between me and Beto? Oh, white knight simp over here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 
お前の浅はかな推理など私一人を超えることもできぬわ死ねえ Okay. <laughs> What is going on here? Okay, he's a dragon. Kinzo is a dragon now. Alright, this is happening. Kinzo's jet black cape spread as though he would swallow the world, becoming the snout of a vast black dragon, which came at me, trying to swallow me in one mouthful. As I faced the roaring of the black dragon, I calmed my breathing and closed my eyes lightly. <laughs> ダマリナ、死に損ないの亡霊め。ほう、わしを亡霊呼ばわりしてみせるか。あくまでもわしはすでに死んでおるとする仮説を貫くか。それがお前の命取りよ。第四のゲームの第一の番にて、闇に飲み込まれて消え去るがよい。Black Dragon's vast mouth, its snout, its fangs threatened to swallow Badler whole. In that instant, Badler suddenly opened his eyes. I'm waiting for him to all of a sudden, he's in like night gear, and he's like, I will slay the beast and slay the witch. Oh, okay. I love how confident he is. Go, Badler, go. <laughs> こいつでお別れだぜ。俺は金蔵死亡説が第四のゲームでも主張できる根拠として、以下の仮説を提唱する。よかろう。存分に来るがよい。我が末裔よ。行くぜ、クソジジ。金蔵の名は。Oh. oh, okay. So, kind of like the witch, the name Beatrice, the witch is passed down. Huh. Whoa, interesting. Oh. I never would have thought that as a possibility. Damn, Badler, that's really smart. Who would it be? Would it be? Would it, I'm trying to think of who Kinzo would possibly pass that down to. Would it be Genji, maybe? Does it even have to be a man? Could it be a woman, maybe? I find it hard to believe that Kinzo would pass the name down to a woman because that just seems like the type of guy he is. He's very old fashioned like that. So I would think, like, Genji or maybe Canon? That might be out there. If he was to pass it down, I feel like it would be Genji. Or what about Beato? Could Beato have taken the name Kinzo? という事実は変わらないこれで留め出せクソ自身お前に復唱要求だ全人物の中で異なる複数の名前を持つ人物は存在しないおー oh. Okay. Yasrakani Nemrina, so did he. Concha Shiroyo. Oma Yato Sinetan does, eh? Koitsuga Indoda. Kratek Tabarina. Alright. Right? Yes. 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 Yes.
Okay. So our last Beto is actually going to shoot some of the stuff down. I'm sure I will still have things that are going to be unanswered in this tea party. But uh, I'm getting a lot of answers here, so I'm just like, I wonder how many theories I'll be able to come up with that won't already have been proven. Not quite, though. We're, we're not that far into the tea party yet. Uh, Beto's gonna pull something out. I know she will. She took He took down Kinzo, but we still have a lot of stuff to go over. Several dozen blue stakes bore into Kinzo's ghost. Their terrible destructive power would never permit the ghost to recover. Uh, Dispersing along with the shadow of the black dragon as golden flowers petals scattered. Ushur Miyakinzo became a gold-colored cyclone and disappeared. Even after death, you fought for the sake of the woman you loved. Your love and madness were, without a doubt, the real thing. <laughs> Looks like she lost one of her pieces, too. Beto still couldn't put out the blue wedge that pierced her foot. Beto realized she was on the verge of death. As I've seen before, even when it seems like she's about to lose, she's she's good at that last minute turnaround, so I'm just waiting. So even she's she's goading him to kill her so he can she can do something to him or she just wants to finish this. Oh, Alright, we're glossing over a lot of stuff here. I guess he's not gonna go into the details as long as he can disprove this stuff. As long as that's all he needs to do is just prove that it wasn't a witch, it was a human. He doesn't need to go into the nitty-gritty details. What? 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 He did it? He did it. This seems so sudden. Several blue stakes were driven into Beatrice, who could not dodge, skewering her. Beato grabbed the stakes, trying to pull them out somehow. Wow, okay. Wow, okay. With both hands, Beto firmly grasped one of the blue stakes. Mm. 
Naturally, the power of the blue truth to deny witches burned her hands. Unable even to hide her tears at the pain, Beato howled and tried to pull the stakes out with all her might. Alright, she's gonna... Alright, so she says she's gonna try and counterattack here. Okay, so now is she going to is she going to bring up every single thing of magic and have him explain all of it? Because yeah, this could take a while. Certainly, Rosa had witnessed gold butterflies gather and fix a marshmallow by the miracle of magic. <laughs> well, no, like if Rosa was an accomplice, now that we've gone to the idea of accomplices, she could just say whatever to make it seem like there's a witch or something, right? So, yeah, not very credible. <laughs> But we could say all witnesses potentially could be accomplices, too. Like, whoa, all the, like, the goats and everything, and the magical girls. Yeah. I guess it would be ha pretty hard to, uh, explain, yeah, there's, like, that's five people... Well, at least five people. All the people in the dungeon, plus Gota and Kumasawa saying they saw all that stuff. That's, yeah, that's a lot of people as accomplices. That does seem a little far-fetched. Alright, Battler. Let's, let's hear this one. This one is an interesting thing you're trying to disprove. <laughs> I love no matter how much pain she's in, she will scream his name every time. Oh, okay. Oh, the brawn tube. We... Been a while since we brought that up. なるが。何魔法を目撃しようとも。それは魔法の存在の証明にはならない。俺はお前が見せてきた全ての魔法の存在する市内の遺憾に関わらず、それは俺の不可侵の権利である。違ったか。at those words, the blue stakes let out an even brighter light, repelling my hands away. <laughs> As Badler is now, even if I cited each individual piece of magic and demanded an explanation for each, he would probably use any means available to, uh, to him to deny all of them. Not just the marshmallow magic that I showed Rosa, but all my magical miracles. I can no longer even claim to be a witch without entering into debates about how something like a marshmallow was fixed. I'm in such an inferior position that I am forced to fight over trivialities like that. いつか破れる日が来るのは当然のこと。我らはバトラに破れるためだけに今日までを戦ってきたというのか。勝てるかもしれないと初めたゲームだった。簡単には勝てなくても無限に繰り返すゲームの中でいつかは奇跡が起こ
this is the big overarching question is why we know obviously why Battler is doing this, but why is Beatrice doing this? Why is she so hell bent on proving to Battler that magic exists? And then of course there's that whole sin. The sin. I gotta get into that too, man. I gotta figure out what that sin is. ま、私には毎日の奇跡も絶対にない。いや。奇跡も絶対もない。が正しいのか。勝利はなく。引き分けによる終了もない。唯一許された決着。敗北を与えられるまで永遠と抗うだけの I looked into Badler's eyes. It was not me inside them. Reflected in those eyes were the figures of the little sister waiting for his return, and the family he had to bring back to her. He no longer sees me, even as an individual. Of course he doesn't. From the very beginning, he's been fighting to deny the individual that I am. <sighs> it's such a thing, it's like, maybe it's not the whole thing, it's a witch, she just wants him to see her. Whoever this Beatrice, he just want, she just wants to be acknowledged by him in some way, and now she's just like, her losing is the fact that he's been given the, uh, what's the word? Like he's been given a reason to do this, and it's not her. It has nothing to do with her anymore. It's about his family. So she's just like being denied by him even more. And that's why she's going to lose. Because it was before it was about the two of them against each other, but now he's just like, he doesn't even care about her. Because the thing is, like, as long as he's doing this, all his attention is on Beatrice, and that's what she wants. バトラが殺っと騙されたまま永遠に騙し続けてる場合よかったんだ。でもダメなんだよな。あれじゃ本当の勝ちじゃないんだよな。これだ。チェックメイトか。ベアトリーチェ。Run through, was, run through with several blue stakes, Beto was still in a standing position, skewered to the ground many times over, unable even to fall over because of this, and still looking up into the sky, she was sewn in place. Her tragic form might have been a fitting end, for the cruel witch who had endlessly toyed with eighteen people's lives, and who had killed constantly for hundreds and thousands of years. Gently, as though someone were mourning for something, rain began to fall. Amid that rain, Beato was exposed to the elements, crucified. I think that's it. I think as soon as she realized he he wasn't fighting with her anymore, he didn't care about her anymore and what happens to her, she gave up. She's just like, this is about me versus him, me playing with him, and now that he has his family, he doesn't care about me anymore. I don't want to play. I'm done. <laughs> とどめをさせよ。一枚よ、お前の青き真実で。以上により魔女は存在しないって。一枚よ。その一撃で私の息の根を止めてしまえ。ダメだな。
No goddamn good at all. Oh. さらせというのか。すでに決着はついておろうに。立てよ。俺たちの殴り合いは。ま、まだ。どうだ。お前のそれは負けじゃない。もうやめたと。投了しているだけだ。いいではないかよ。投了で。それでそなたの勝ちだろうが。とっとと妹のところへ帰るがいい。わらわなどこの場に打ち捨てていけ。俺は言ったはずだ。逃げない。そしてお前を逃がさないとな。Well. <笑> お前は… He wants to know this stuff. He's like, I have so many questions. Yes, yes. Are we actually going to get this answer today? I don't think so. So they saying a fan she's saying a fantasy and illusion. So it does seem like it's just, it's someone, whoever this Beatrice is, it's like, yeah, it's some sort of fantasy that they've come up with, like another version of themselves. Uh, I have so many questions about her.幻想の暗闇に逃げ帰らせはしない。打ち破る。完全にな。だから立て。弱々しいふりなんかするな。お前はまだなんてか隠してる。俺にはわかる。Of いとこのみんなや親族のみんなを。そして使用人のみんなを。お前はあれだけもてあそんで殺した。その非道を俺は絶対に忘れない。許さない。俺の肩にはよ。まだエンジェの腕の感触が残ってるんだよ。俺はお
魔女の道に落ちた時から悪魔と契約をしたその日から末路は悲劇であるとどうした So she made a contract maybe to get out of、um, that situation with Kinzo. So, like, she's definitely seen as a little bit of a tragic figure herself, but I want to know more about her. Lightning. The world was smashed with white. Fitting last moments for the ruler of Rokunjima. <laughs> She can definitely laugh better than me. <laughs> Is this just her last hurrah? Or was she actually like, oh, I tried to act all frail and you saw right through it? Good job. Still pierced by the blue stakes, Beato faced the rainy sky and let out a laugh. I think this is her just putting on a front, being like, all right, he wants me to face this like a true witch, I will do that. Then she slowly raised her face and fixed her eyes on Fadler. <laughs> I still don't know if she's just playing with him or not. If she doesn't actually have a way out of this, if she's just prostrating, if she's just, you know, like being her usual over the top self, or if she actually was just hiding those moves, like he said. <laughs> お前から奪い取るものだ。お前だってそうだろうが。俺が魔女はいてもいいからなんて言い出す。そんな甘っちょろい勝ち方が納得できなかったから、前回はわざと合わせて最後にぶっ壊してくれたんだろうが。そうさ
Okay. とんでもねえ奥の手を隠してやがったぜ。十七人しか人間のいない島が十八人と偽られてきた。それが一人減って十七人になり、ようやく正しい数になったってわけだ。But she is still saying that there's no mysterious person that was the actual murderer who's not in that group. The blue wedge that had sewn Beto into place broke apart. So she knew she could take that out the whole time, but she intentionally didn't. There was no longer anything piercing Beato. The scars on her body had disappeared completely. Then, there, just as Badler had hoped for, stood the imposing figure of the Golden Witch who ruled Rokunjima. Now, this is the actual, maybe, final fight. <laughs> maybe. But I'm okay with this. Because that means we're going to get some more information. It's like Valor said, he wasn't going to accept that because he still has... He has a lot of questions he wants answered, and if she just gave up then, those would all never be answered. Oh! Yes, all right, here we go. I love that we're getting back to the, the basics that I forgot about. また殺人は執行者、犠牲者が共に同室して行われた。執行者が室外から殺害する手段は存在しない。Okay, the dead. Oh, what? Oh, yes. That's right. And then she started changing it so that the faces could be identified because of this whole thing about, like, well, now you can use that as a, uh, as a potential, like, uh, not an excuse, but like a theory. And that's... I said that in my theory video. I'm sure I said that. Wait, she's not even denying that. Wait, is she just going to say like, okay, you're right about that? Or is she just like, huh? Okay, now she's saying include the dead as well. What if Kanan killed himself? What if he did that to himself? Yeah. Yeah. Because she didn't say that it was a homicide in red. Oh, okay, so she's straight up saying that. Never mind. Okay, so it's not a suicide, but it's also maybe not a homicide. Okay, 
Was it maybe a trap set up? Maybe he ran into a, a, a stake that was left there? Because he didn't intentionally kill himself, but maybe it was it had been a trap set up by somebody. An accident, okay. どのような土地を踏んで自己死に至ったかについての説明は悪魔の証明により説明拒否。ほほ。悪魔の力を身につけたそなたは今や敵なしだな。有効である。<笑> Okay, she says it's valid. Maria did it. <laughs> oh, immediately she shuts me down. I don't think Maria actually did it. I was just joking. そもそもあの三人の顔面も粉砕されていたどれかが替え玉死体の可能性は十分にある身元不明死体について Seems like a little bit of a reach, but... Yeah, <laughs> I agree with Beitariche. <laughs> she didn't deny it, though. <laughs> Oh, did it, like, so she didn't mean to kill herself, but it was, uh, it, did it, like, blow up in her face or something? Ah, okay.夏日の額に生まれし銃弾は夏日の銃から放たれたものではない夏日おばさんは内容不明の手紙により帯引き出された可能性があるそしてオールに呼び出されたそして特定の時刻に特定の場所に立つように強いられてあらかじめ設置された
just by her existing, will be killed and made to suffer over and over. And Angie will be burdened with a future of isolation. そう Rosa would be the most likely, if we're talking about having um, accomplices, Rosa would be the most obvious in this case. Maria Kagi Okay, here we are, back to pretending to be dead. And I think I said this in my theory video, too, about someone pretending to be dead. I have to go back and check. Not so much for that. アリバイがない人間が存在した。そんな誰かが6人を殺し、内側に隠れていたと仮定すれば問題ない。a tremendous exchange of red and blue truth. The stakes and wedges of blue truth and I, that I sent flying, darted at Beato, one after the other. And one after another, Beato cut them down with her red truth, her red treasured sword, knocking them out of the air. The blood she had lost from the first game was probably awful. This intense exercise was putting her under even greater strain. I could see her breath growing ragged. That's why I can't hold back now. I'll corner that witch. And this time, I'll break through her. <laughs> All right, now we're getting a little crazy. But you know what? It's so crazy, it might just be correct. <laughs> I refuse to explain. <laughs> <laughs> but Beto failed to knock down the blue wedge as it flew at an angle like a curveball. So as long as it's a devil's proof that he doesn't have to explain, then it, it can be effective. It let out a loud thunk and gouged itself deeply into her left shoulder. I will lose my mind if that's actually what happened when small bombs blew open their stomachs. However, despite being on the receiving end of it, it seemed she couldn't stop laughing at how much of a curveball it was. 
No wonder. Even I'm amazed at how screwed up this reasoning is. If he just keeps throwing random bullshit at her, then I'll just overwhelm her with bullshit and I will win. Monkarnoka. <laughs> 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 Oh my gosh, I I don't even remember this stuff happening. There was just so much stuff that's happened in all these chapters. I forgot about that whole thing with Cannon's being all like, his guts all spilling out, and yet he managed to kill them anyway, apparently. Alright, so now we're getting into traps and disguises and um, fake bodies. I like this. This is the kind of stuff I have thought about and have said and would in this situation if I were Bedler. Is it the same situation like with a Kinzo? Yeah. Yes. Because that's not his real name, right? It could be like a servant name. And it's just given to, like, it can just be given to people at random. Yeah. That's the whole thing too, right? Like, Shannon and Cannon, that's not their real names, so... That could be used as, like, by Beato, if she says Canon or Shannon, right? Like, that's not actually their name, so that might be some sneaky little thing that she's using, just like with Kinzo. We never did find out Canon's real name, though, did we? We know Shannon's, it's Sayo, but not Canon's yet. A sound like a watermelon being squashed rang out, and a blue wedge was buried deep into Beato's left flank. It looked like she felt that one. Maybe it hit her in her bad spot. After leaning over and moaning for a while, she laughed it off as though trying to make it seem like it was no big deal. I can tell. That must have hurt like a bitch. <laughs> When Beto howled, the wedge that had pierced her was blasted away. But the wound remained and continued tormenting her with intense pain. いいのか。続けていくぜ。第2のゲームの最後の殺人。夏尾場さんの部屋で死んだ3人についての青木真実は。18人目のXを否定されても有効のはず。赤で反論があるか。なければ、第2のゲームも俺のものだ。ああ、
すぐったいくらいよ<笑>全身を細切れにされてクズにくずにされたお,お前の妹に比べればね And even when she's in the, like, actively dying, she shit talks like a boss. いつまでへばってやがれてめえを地獄に叩き落としてやるのはこれからだ Now a lot of this we know can be explained by Ava being the murderer in a lot of these cases これくらいでへばるものかそうともまだまだこれからよさあ第三のゲームを始めようぞまずは最初の六連結のレーザー密室本来ならこの密室はそなたが当時にカンパしているしかしそなたは金蔵を殺してしまった At the time, I, I hypothesized that Gramps was the culprit and that after killing the other five and stringing the keys across each room he constructed his own locked room in the boiler room where in the middle of carrying out some kind of scheme He had an accident which resulted in him burning to death in the boiler. But now I've gone and declared that Gramps was already dead, so I've denied my own theory. The irony. This could be the situation where someone was pretending to be a dead body, and the whole thing with the key, if they had a master key, they could do this somehow, right? But she's probably gonna shoot that down. However. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm saying. I'm not sure what I'm saying. I'm not sure what I'm saying. That's a little out there. Master Key, go home was sweet. Oh, no, she only knows the color of the red and the red. But if one of them wasn't actually dead, has she, has she declared that all the bodies there were, were actually dead? And then, like, because I was the thing is, like, we never checked those rooms again. They stayed locked. I don't think. I'm trying to think if there was a time where anyone went into the locked rooms after. Oh, no, I guess George did, right? When he went to go see Shannon. Uh. But I was like, someone could have been playing dead and then used the master key to lock the room up again for the rooms that we never investigated afterwards. Ah, I think I also said gas at some point too. Uh, <laughs> Okay, they all had fatal wounds. Well, that shoots down my theory then. Okay. しかし、最後の部屋の鍵だけはどうしても密室内に戻せない。だが、戻すことはできたぜ。死体の第一発見者が鍵を見つけたふりをして、誰かの死体のポケットから取り出して見せればいいからだ。Smart, smart. I didn't even think about that. So there's another accomplice. She couldn't fully block that blue stakes retort. Pushed back by the blue wedges. Well, it could, it might not be a matter of、uh, an accomplice. It could just be the actual killer who is among the ones who found it. Now, I'm trying to think, was it Nanjo who, who found the bodies? For, who was the first one to find the bodies in the third chapter? I can't remember. All right, pushed back by the blue wedges, unleashed one after another. Beito finally failed to block one and once again took a severe wound. 
As she howled in pain, she pulled out the blue wedge that had pierced her right arm. Beto's entire body had been slashed and pierced with blue wedges, stakes, and blades over and over again. And by now, her whole body was covered in blood. But even so, Beto grinned, cackled as though she was enjoying it. エンジェル、不要連れ戻してきたくするという約束した男がどの口で親を犯人にした説を語るというのか。いいぜ。それでもいいんだぜ。家族で仲良く大量殺人に手を染めて。決して家に血にまみれながらエンジェのところに帰れ
わらわも風前のともしびであるな<笑><笑>ということはこの南條先生殺しの謎だけがお前が魔女であることの最後の防衛戦ってことになるな。I'm trying to remember how Dr. Nancho died in the third game, where he was found, and what happened to him. I legit can't remember. Yeah, she's just needling him. Of course, she's got more. She's just trying to make him seem like he's so close to winning. Yep. <laughs> Battler's done this enough times, he knows. ソナタという公的種によって生涯を閉じるのも悪くないと思い始めているそなたならやれるよなやってくれよ頼むよ殺してくれよ殺してばっかりでさ殺された試しがねえんだよ<笑> お前ら十八人を幾百と殺してはきたけれど殺された試しは一度もねえから一回くらいは経験してみてんだよ。It was a graceless show of bravado, unchanged from before. But blood dripped from her mouth. Her once beautiful dress was covered with holes, and blood poured from all over her body. Making her physical appearance look very different from her attitude. Perhaps she was still suffering from the shot she'd taken to the flank. The way she was unconsciously clutching it lacked any trace of elegance. But there's no room for compassion. As long as I feel sympathy for the Switch, my family and I won't be released from this place. Until I defeat her, we won't be able to go home. In this world we live in, even people who see each other as enemies can come to understand each other. The situation changes. But absolute evil does exist. That is an evil which brings misfortune by its very existence and is to be spared no composure or compromise just by continu continuing to exist. It is evil. This is going against the whole thing with Angie and, and Ava and,、uh, and Kasumi. Where it's like,、uh, he's not trying to understand her, and I, I understand why he wouldn't want to after everything she's done to him. But maybe that's the truth. Maybe that's the truth to all this is finding the compassion for her and finding out why she is doing this and why she feels this way. Why she feels so much whatever towards Badler. I don't even know what she feels towards him anymore. Is it love? Is it hate? Disdain? I don't know. ゲームの駒だぜ毎回毎回最初の6人は誰を殺そうかな次の2人はどう殺そうかなもっともっとグロい殺し方はねえかなって考えるのは最高に楽しいぜなあバートラーよ少し改心するから今回も。Oh wow, she's just mocking him for the time that he was. Which one was that? That was the third one, right? Where he had that little bit of compassion for her. Oh, 
人の命をもてあそぶってのはよお前なら考えつくよ天智をもっともっとクズ肉にしてやる方法はよ来いよバトラー南城殺し暴いてみろ The 18th person X was destroyed, but I won't give in. I'll stop that which is breathing cold. The end of the third game it was declared in red the four survivors at that point in time Badler, Ava, Jessica, and Nanjo. Oh, that's right! That's right, now I remember. We're all unrelated to Nanjo's murder. Yes, that's when Nanjo took Jessica, I think, into the, um, the servant's place to give her first aid. Because she had been. Sprayed in the face with something, right? She got something in her in her face. It was like gunpowder or something, because I didn't like Ava shoot at her or something, and she was blinded. And it was also declared he was murdered directly, right before his eyes. All the other people had the strongest alibi of having their deaths declared there. Yes, that's right. Someone came to the door while Ava and Badler were looking for the murderer. I think. And then Jessica was in the room with with uh, with Nanjo, and then Nanjo answered the door, and he got killed. But Jessica couldn't see it because she was blinded. All other people, the strongest alibi of having their deaths declared in red, without using the 18th person X. I have to break through this. Think, don't stop thinking. Her red doesn't only bind me; it's also supposed to be her weak point. I've got to somehow use it against her. That's right. There is still a gap. Yeah, this way I can break through it. Beatrice's legend of the witch is over. Tashikani. ナンジョ先生を殺した時点では生きていた何者かがエヴァの死亡宣言までの間に死亡していればその感激は縫えることになるつまりはこういうことさエヴァの死亡宣言で初めて死亡とされた人物の中に犯人がいてその人物は最初
even if she was his enemy. Ah, good guy battler. Gentlemen. <laughs> but even so, unless he destroyed Beatrice, the battle wouldn't end. Batora. Tanomoyo. Huh? Beato let out a sob. <laughs> is she really just at this point? Is she just giving up? No more game? She just like, just kill me. Just put me out of my misery. Oh, <laughs> Well, she's the eternal witch, right? He's the only one that can that can end her. Beto's expression was a soggy mess of blood and tears. Yeah, I don't think she's joking her. I don't think she's got any sort of like final fight in her. I think this is it. Certainly, Balor had been tricked by her at one point. So he could probably have suspected. Yeah. Certainly, Balor had been tricked by her at one point, so he could probably have suspected her expression, and even her tears would be an act. However, Badler believed those tears. After all, those tears had the red of truth mixed in with them. Oh, okay. She just gonna tell me everything right now? Her heart. Were those tears of pain and torment, or else? Either way, that pitiful expression was painful for Badler to look at, even after burning with such anger. <laughs> it's amazing how, how much she's gone through in this episode. Not that long ago, she was taunting him, saying, like, your sister was cut up into little pieces and I'm gonna do the same to you. I'll do it to her over and over again. And now, not, what, 10, 20 minutes later, look, look where she is. Oh, Badler. Good guy, Badler. Even for his worst enemy, I feel like he can't stand to see someone, especially a woman, in pain. <laughs> Their last breaths, Beato summoned up all of her remaining strength and managed to close both of her hands into fists. A red light began to gather at those fists. Oh, what's going on here? Then she lifted her arms as though wishing for something from heaven.
The red light around both her arms got stronger and stronger. I feel like there's some love there. Because she said she's going to lay her heart bare, pierce, pierce her heart to kill her. I think that's what he needs to do is just like stab her in the heart to end it. There's some love, there's some hate. There's definitely some emotions with her towards him. I just wish I knew why. She got that far into the word, and then her face tilted to the side a bit. Her right arm lost its light and flopped down. But her left arm alone did not lose its light and remained held up towards the heavens. Then, before Badler's eyes, another Beato appeared with a faint form, transparent like a curtain. The crucified Beato had already lost consciousness. However, the newly appeared faint Beato quietly looked at me, her eyes expressionless, and spoke in an uncharacteristically polite tone. Oh, we got some red truth. What's this? What? 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 Sorry, I didn't mean to skip. Ah, what? そしてたった今この島にはあなた以外誰もいませんこの島で生きているのはあなただけです島の外の存在を So even at the end no, Nobody survives What I understood This was the only thing left keeping Beatrice a witch The final mystery Right the whole thing about the epitaph that I with everything else going on, I was like, oh yeah, you gotta solve that too. Beato was holding it out to me, entreating me to solve her final mystery and kill her. Yeah, he's still gonna die somehow. Despite being the only one left alive. I am not you. Okay. <laughs> He's not even phased by this, of hearing that he was about to die, right as he was about to win, apparently. Right, who are you? This is the big mystery. Who is she? Oh, then Beatrice slowly approached me and held me, expressionless. Oh, wait, 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 ah! Wait, why is it skipping head? I held her head and then my piece left the game board. What? What? I don't know why it was skipping ahead like this. What the hell? What? Okay. Okay. He died on the 10th Twilight, so he died anyway. Angie died in 1998? Oh yeah, I guess that makes sense, because that was the, the one who went back in time. What the hell? Died on the ninth twilight, seventh twilight, first twilight. So in this case, the fact that Kinto died on the ninth twilight implies that he survived. Even though Badler was saying from the beginning that Kinto was dead the whole time. But that's that whole thing about like Kinzo. Kinzo is just a name. It could be passed down. That last part I can't. I can't quite parse what just happened. So that's the big mystery Beatrice asked, is who am I? And the fact that he's the only one left alive on the island. He still died. I was kind of annoyed that, like, for some reason, the uh, it was auto-playing and I couldn't... I couldn't read the last little bit that was said, so I'll have to go back and check that out while I'm editing. Well, I guess that's the big overarching question I'm going to have to bring up in my, you know, uh, my theory video is who is Beatrice?
I can't even... I don't even know where I'm gonna go with it. Like, oh, I feel like it's gonna take me two weeks just to try and, like, come up with a theory video because there's so much. Like, there was so much, even in this last little bit, going over all of the games. All the stuff Badler said that uh, wasn't really confirmed. Alliance of the Golden Witch. Oh, man, oh, man. It's just a whole lot. I can't wait to get to the answer arcs, though. I can't wait to get some, like, concrete answers of, like, what is going on. What's happening? Oh, man. All right, well... Okay, well, of course we've got more. I always forget about this. The, uh, the tea party aspect, like the... The purgatory place, I'm guessing, is where we're going. I, this has already been so long, I, I don't know how much more we got of this, but let's, let's go into it. Unknown fragments. I'm not even going to attempt to say that number. Scattered over the bra uh, the big bed were cute jelly beans of various colors and chocolate coins. A fork was stuck into the shortcake peeking out of a gift box. And there were de uh, decanters with drinks of various colors lined up on the side table. But the venomous color of the drink poured into the glass matched none of the decanters. Someone had probably been playing around, mixing them together. The taste aside, that was a lot of fun to do. On top of the fluffy bed were several colorful big pillows stuffed with dreams. Oh, and on the big bed that looked like something out of a child's dream world. Burn Castell lay face down, and Lambda Delta lay face up, hugging a pillow and relaxing. なかなかかなら yeah, that is his one. It could be seen as a positive, but a negative as well, is that he does get too emotional. He gets all up in his emotions. おかしな方向にゲームを流すかもしれないって危惧してたの。エンジェは That's true. <laughs> Two of them together would have been unstoppable. あ、もったいないコマだった。<laughs> <笑>当然でしょ。あんな古いコマ取ったと言いたいやしてくれないと困るわ。まあ、結果的にゲーム中断を阻止する活躍をしてくれたし、それは私にとっても助かることだった。互いの利害が一致する活躍をしてくれた
あ,あ本当に惜しい駒だったわその子も今じゃ引き肉ねえ後で一緒にそれでハンバーグ作りましょうよあ餃子の方が好きだっけ妹味ってどんな味かしら<笑>笑えるあんたそんな余裕でいいのエンジェのおかげでバトラは奮起ベアトを猛追し始め今やだいぶ私が有利なゲーム展開だと思うけどというかバトラ今回でこれまでのほとんどの謎を解いちゃったんじゃない Almost all of the mysteries But he did it in a way that still like I can still have my theories about exactly how things happen. He had kind of like a、um, he gave ideas of how it could be explained by human means, but he didn't go into that much detail. So there's still a lot of questions about the exact hows and whys. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, there were some real out there things for sure. <laughs> I did feel like Beatrice was taking it easy on him, just like、um, relinquishing things and be like, okay, that's a valid point, even though some of them were absolutely insane. Ah. <laughs> What if it ended up being right, though? ボイラー室のカノンは事故死だったろうとしてるけど <笑>自分の胸に悔いが突き刺さっちゃう事故って何よバッカじゃない私が赤き宝刀とやらで切ってやるわよカノンは事故死ではないあ、we're I thought that one was out there too. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought the whole thing about Natsui being lured into a trap could have been a valid. Option, but I guess not. ご愁傷様。あんた、そんなことあたりいっちゃ。あの子、夏日の銃弾を魔法で跳ね返して殺したってことにしてるんだから。ああ、あらあらいけない。そうだったわね。第二のゲームの青き真実だってあますぎよ
ローザからマスターキーを借りたという推理もダメダメローザがマスターキーを管理して以降それら全ては一度たりとも彼女の手を離れていない夏日の部屋を開場した時にバトラに貸し出した際を除いてねまだまだ続くけどざっと軽く見てもこんな感じかしら軽くも何も<笑>あんた第一と第二のゲームにおけるバトラの青き真実あらあらなんてことバトラがそれを聞いたらそっとしちゃうわねねえレアとは全然追い詰められてなんかいないのよあの子やっぱりなかなかの役者だわきっと今回のゲームでは一見追い詰められたふりをしてみせて次のゲームあたりでバサーッと赤で一刀両断にしてバトラをびっくり仰天させる作戦でしょうよ Did Badler and I get fooled again by b e t r i c h e I don't know She seemed so sincere at the end when she seemed like I just want to end this, but maybe she is just a really good actress. <laughs> <laughs> あいつ本当に大女優よね全然追い詰められてなんかいないのに<笑>最終回顔負けのクライマックス感だったわ Well this is the last of the question arcs anyway So it seemed fitting 今年の助演女優賞はあいつに決定ねまあもちろん主演は私だけど出るんでもいいわよ私を殺してみたいなことを言って最後それを解かれたらベアとは今度こそおしまいの排水の陣じゃないの<笑>やだベルまで騙されてるのあんなの排水の陣でもなんでもないベアとはねまだまだどぎつい奥の手を温存してるわ最後の謎を出すために両腕を突き出した時右腕だけ下ろしたの気づいてたああ、mm. そういうこと。Okay. あれはそういう意味だったわけ。そういうわけ。あの子はまだまだ奥の手を残してる。そして何も謎は解かれちゃいない。What did that mean when she put down her arm, though? Like, what was that hidden move? それをまるで、すべてカンポされて、次回、最終回、<笑>みたいなテンションにしちゃうなんて。つくづくあの子は演技の天才よああ、早くバトルをどん底に叩き落とすところが見てやりたいわあの子、前回のゲームの北風と対応作戦ですっかり味を占めちゃったんじゃないバトラ、きっとまたベアトに同情してコロッと引っかかるわよ女の涙は一粒で男を騙せるからね実に安上がりでお得よねバトラまたその手に引っかかっちゃうかしら二度と同情しないように私もバトラを焚きつけないと It worked on Badler and me I did feel some sympathy at her toward the end She seemed so pathetic 当分はエンジェのひき肉で焚きつけられそうだけどねエンジェ味のハンバーグでパワーアップもちろんこっちも負けないわよここからバトラと拮抗するくらいに盛り返せるよベアトを徹底的にサポートするもの負けないわよベアトは負けたら素敵な罰ゲームがあるわよってきっちり脅してるもんあんたの罰ゲーム本気でシャレにならないから少し加減した方がいいわよベルに次に罰ゲームをできるときはこうしようって決めてるのがあるの聞きたい聞きたい嫌よ<笑>もう聞いてよあのねあのねベルを素敵な素敵なお城に閉じ込めてあげるのそのお城は真っ白な純白の城壁に囲まれていて一辺は 12km 高さは 10m あるの
魔法とズルは禁止とても飛び越せないわよね14億4千万流米話のうちが読めたからもういいわよ<笑>そこをね毎日一粒ずつの宝石で埋めていくのそれで城壁いっぱいにたまるまでベルンを閉じ込めてその宝石で埋め殺すの素敵なロマンチックな罰ゲームでしょ1辺を5倍にしていいから高さを10分の1にしてくれたら今から閉じ込めてもいいわよ本当三 ?36 億流米になるわよ罰ゲームが倍以上の期間になるわよ<laughs> Lambda Delta playfully clung to Burn Castell, who yawned, looking bored, as she stroked Lambda Delta under the chin, as though playing with a cat. Their relationship is weird, too. <laughs> Just like how they seem to be enemies, but also friends, and also maybe more? Well, they, Beato said herself, she's like, there's a 0% chance that there, it's like, I'm certain, it's certain I'm going to lose. Yep. <laughs> Unusually for them, they giggle together. ベアトが勝ちそうになったら私たち二大魔女を敵に回すことになる。そういうことね。私たちの力が最も均衡するのは引き分けとバトラ有利の中間で均衡している場合のみ。ベアと有利に傾きすぎれば、私たちは共に同じベクトルに団結して。つまり、ベアと優勢になった瞬間、私たちふ
レアとは絶対に勝利できないそして奇跡は絶対に起こらない The more they say she can't, the more I'm like, but maybe she will? I don't want her to But I'm just like, they're just so adamant that she won't <laughs> Oh, oh, that was creepy Oh. All right, so it looks like we've got a couple of new things here, and then we'll wrap up this super long episode. So I think I was told to execute. Uh, battler missing, bound for hell in the witch's embrace, but to the witch, that hell is the golden land, and we will resurrect. Oh, who is this? Well, there we go. There's a new one. They did mention someone. Uh, who was it that mentioned it? Was was it Beatrice or was it Kinzo? Someone else who mentioned it and just like, I think it was Kinzo and really pissed off the Chester sisters. Chester 556, a weapon of the sisters cavalry. Which serves Pendragon. Although 556 was a quiet girl who was always being teased, she was loved by everybody. However, luck was not on her side, and she suffered a brutal death in a battle with the Black Witch. She was a state-of-the-art weapon, and added color to the sisters' cavalry, which had the strong flavor of an honor guard. 556 was in charge of squad fire support. She shot not to kill, but to protect her allies. There we go, now we revived her. A quiet girl who is always being teased by everyone, but that is because they love her very much. The trumpet is her specialty. Everyone skips to her lively tone. Alright, so now we got the tips here. Alright, let's just, uh, we'll just power through these really quick, because there's a lot here, so I'll read these out. So first we got the Mariage Socia. A witch's alliance formed by Lady Maria, the Witch of Origins, and Lady Beatrice, the Endless Witch. The two of them created a groundbreaking new system of magic, thereby granting Beatrice, whose magical power had begun to decline, immense new magical power. You could probably say it was through the formation of this alliance that Beatrice gained the endless power in the true sense. Article 1 requires members to accept each other as witches and respect each other's magic. At at one point, young Angie was invited into the Alliance, but she was later excommunicated. System of Magic, a foundation upon which to create magic. In particular, it refers to a system by whose shared usage uh, magic power can be gained without conscious effort. You could say writing down their own system of magic and leaving it to future generations is one of a witch's life's works. However, systems of terrific magical power are correspondingly difficult to comprehend, and shared usage of them is troublesome. As a result, none will appear to bear the burden. If a system's magical power is simple, there will likely be no difficulty sharing it. But as a result, the system will be reduced to having no greater effect than a simple good luck charm and will ultimately be forgotten. Leaving a system of magic for later generations while simultaneously maintaining that balance is the true joy of witchcraft. A grimoire. In short, a grimoire is that into which a system of magic is written down and transmitted to later generations. The most famous grimoire in the world today has a 2,000 year history, is still in circulation, and is said to be continuing to acquire new alliance members even now. It is forbidden to speak the true name of that grimoire and is simply called the book. Alright, it's Beatrice's titles. As a witch, Beatrice holds the two titles of Endless and Golden. Because these are originally titles from separate systems of magic, it can be said she possesses two systems. The Endless Witch has its foundation in endless creation and is the root of her unmatched endless magical power. The Golden Witch has its foundation in magic realization and her magical power to make the precious metals of fantasy manifest in reality gives the miracle of manifestation to all faint forms of magic. The two of these were polished even further through Mariage Socia, elevating them to a system of magic called Endless Realization. In that sense, she should now be called neither the Endless nor the Golden Witch, but by a new title that is a fusion of the two. Regarding Witches the, defini the definition of a witch is vague, but the most accepted theory is that one is a witch at the point where they can gain a power surpassing humans and are able to use it freely. And the world, or possibly fragment, in which that can be freely used is called their territory. 
Most witches cannot leave their territory, but those who are capable of transcending its boundaries at will and wandering the fragments are called voyagers. In the story, Burn Castell and Lambda Delta fall under this type. Voyagers, worlds of different fates and circumstances are called fragments, and witches who are able to cross the ocean of endless fragments are called voyagers. It is also another name for a high order or high level witch, and witches who are unable to leave their territories cannot compare with their power. However, perhaps because they do not have specific territories, their personal values are unstable, and it's easy for their souls to become faint. As a result, it is not rare for voyagers to disappear like scraps of seaweed in an ocean of fragments. Their voyage has no end point, and perhaps you could even say it is a journey to escape an end point. Witches of a higher order than voyagers are called creators. And regarding creators, creators are sacred beings who can create one out of the sea of nothingness. They can give birth to one from zero, give birth to the endless, and then return to zero again in a flash. They are freed from all restrictions, and the voyagers sometimes even call them gods. In that sense, perhaps the Witch of Origins, Maria, who has promised to become a creator, may be called a chosen one. Voyagers fear the end of their own journey is to become a creator. As to why they would be frightened of evolving into a higher order being, none can understand except they themselves. Okay, that was that was a lot. This was a very long episode. I hope you guys are uh, are happy to have an extra long episode after the very short episode last week. I think I've more than made up for that. Um, so with that done, that is the end of the question arcs. And before we get into the answer arcs, as always, I will do my discussion theory video. I am real nervous about this one. I can't even... I, I'm already stressing about it. There's so much to cover. Like, not only Chapter 4, but potentially factoring into all the stuff that was brought up from the previous games as well that were mentioned in this one. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to have it done by next week. We'll have to see, because uh, I, I got to start actually like writing things down, making a script. Uh, so look forward to that, hopefully next week. Uh, and then we will start it to the answer arc, so we're at the halfway point. So I hope you guys enjoyed the finale of Chapter 4 of Umineko. And I will catch you guys hopefully next Friday with my theory video. If I can get it done in time, we will see. But thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you in the next one. Until then, bye. Special thanks to my top tier patrons. Nana, Sparky, Jared Fan, Joel Ostman, Harry Gaziff, Pirate, Pancake G, Asborn Kennedy, and Icognito.